What I plan to do today is basically go over what I call a kind of a potpourri of, of uh, tax minimization strategies and go through a few examples, very high level, again, just, just to give you the concept of things. And then, um, you know, and, and then talk about how we actually have done these various transactions and integrated, um, you know, some of them in, together as part of one transaction. So the first part I talk about is um, basically going through um, a strategy where to convert non-deductible interest to deductible interest for purposes of uh, income tax. Um, the second part is basically dealing with strategies to um, extract funds from your corporation um, at a more tax effective manner. And then also the, 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 the third part is dealing with a tax um, or an income splitting uh, mechanism uh, to, to shift some investment income over you know, say a higher income earner in the family over to a lower income earner in the family, uh, just again, to kind of minimize the overall family tax tax uh, liability. Um, again, a few years back, a lot of the um, tax strategies we had were kind of wiped out with the budget uh, of 2018. Uh, so these are a few transactions that are still available to us um, and, and that we've been working on with our clients. Um, so the first, so the first uh, thing we'll talk about, again, converting non-deductible interest to deductible interest. And I thought the best way to deal with this, again, is just to give an example, put, you know, put numbers to it, just so you could visually see this and see how it works. So if we take um, a situation where, let's say, an individual has a home, it's valued at a million dollars. On this home, they currently have a mortgage of half a million at a 2.5% interest rate. And um, at the same, <coughs> sorry, at the same time, they also own a investment portfolio worth 400,000 and an expected rate of return on 5% per annum. And again, for purposes of the transaction, we'll assume that the individual is in the top marginal tax rate. So how do we do this conversion? So right now, the individual is, is, is paying interest on a home mortgage, which is non-deductible, <coughs> sorry, um, but yet earning a return on investment on his investments, again, with no, uh, let's say, deduction against that. So how do we get this interest to enable to deduct it from the investment income as opposed to having it on the, on the, on the home, which is non-deductible? So the steps that we would look at, and again, this is very high level. So, you know, there are things we have to consider as we're doing this transaction, but essentially what it would involve is cashing in the investments for 400,000, use that money to pay down the home mortgage, and then essentially take out a home equity loan against the house, take, take, the 400,000 that you previously had invested. So now you're taking a loan to invest. So that 400,000 is taken against the home equity line, invested in the investments. But now because the loan is used for purposes of investing and earning investment income, the interest essentially now becomes deductible against that investment income. So at the end of the situation, at the end of the transaction, <coughs> sorry, at the end of the transaction, the individual is in no no different uh, circumstances that he was before. Still has a home worth a million dollars. Uh, still has a loan or mortgage of five hundred, which is a hundred on the home, four hundred for the investments still has investments of 400,000. So nothing's really changed for them. Um, they, they, again, they just, um, we just converted the, the interest to being uh, deductible versus non-deductible. So if we look at numbers, <coughs> uh, sorry. 
if we look at numbers again, so uh, the first columns pre-tax planning, the one is post-tax planning. So you got investments, 400,000, assume a 5% return. So you're getting a $20,000 retur uh, return in both scenarios. The interest on the investment loan now, assuming again a 2.5% interest rate, pre-planning, you have no deduction. Post-planning, you have a $10,000 interest deduction. So now, as a result of the transaction, your taxable income went from 20,000, which is now uh, 10,000. So you basically halved your taxable income. And again, assuming a maximum tax rate of the individual, essentially your taxes have been uh, halved in this scenario. So you're paying half the tax that you would have paid. So again, this is, this is something to consider. Uh, to do because again it does it does uh, save 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 money and save taxes. Now, like I said, the example is very very high high level. So, other things that need to be considered. Obviously, again, when you're cashing in your investments, um, you got to look at what the accrued gains in those investments are because once you cash them in. You're going to be triggering any capital gains that are uh, inherent in, in in those investments. So, um, again, you, one would have to look at what's that tax bill that we're going to create, and also, you know, you could you, you don't need to cash in all the investments. You can look at you know whether you have any ones that are at break even. If you have any losses, maybe you cash in some capital gains and capital losses to to neutralize the, the tax the tax liability. So again, there's some analysis to, to be done um, before you know you're just cashing in everything. Another thing to consider is that a home equity line of credit, the interest rate on the home equity line of credit could possibly be higher than you know the, the interest rate on the mortgage. So again the, the the cost of financing could could increase slightly. So what you want to make sure is that you know the money you're investing and the return on on the investments is 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 um, sufficient, obviously, to cover that uh, incremental um, interest rate hike. Um, oh, you know you're already getting a tax break on the interest, so that's already a plus. But again, you just want to make sure you invest the money wisely, just to make sure this is a benefit to you. Um, in addition to that, again through a home equity line of credit. Again, in my example, I kind of just loaned the 400,000 uh, just to keep the individual at the same uh, level, if you like, of, of investments. But reality is the home, the, the, you know, the, the home equity line of credit, you could possibly be able to loan a lot more on a million dollar home. You could possibly even loan up to six, 700,000. So there, there would be more money available to you that you could uh, use to invest and 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 um, you know earn earn more earn more money. So so that that's basically you know high level general terms. Now on the same lines, some of you may have heard of the Smith maneuver. Um, this is this is a, a, a strategy that's been out there a long time, and and really what it is is pretty much what we just spoke about where. You're, you're basically converting non-deductible interest to interest with a slight with a slight twist to it. So essentially, what you would do is is obtain from your financial institution. You would obtain what we call a readvanceable mortgage loan uh, from the lender. And and what this is is it kind of has two parts to it, where you it, you'd have a regular mortgage and then a readvanceable. Uh, um, home equity line of credit with it. Um, I know, like Scotia Bank, they have what they call the STEP program, which is one of these readvanceable uh, mortgage mortgages, um, and and pretty much all the banks have have this. But and and so what you would do here is you'd have the mortgage on the home, you use the funds in the line of credit to invest, you know, in the income producing assets. So the interest portion. On the on the amount used in the investment is is deductible. The amount used, obviously, for the home mortgage is non-deductible. 
But now what happens is when you start to earn that investment income, you know, you, and, and, you know, net of, net of any taxes, you take your net investment income and you pay down, you use that to pay down the home mortgage. And by paying down the home mortgage, the readvanceable portion of the high, uh, of the home equity line of credit increases. So, so the, the total amount of the facility stays the same, except now we start to pay down the mortgage, which reduces the non-deductible interest. And as we pay down that mortgage, the readvanceable amount increases. So we take that money, reinvest it in, 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 in you know, stock portfolio or an investment property. And uh, that interest now becomes deductible. And essentially, you just keep repeating this process year after year after year, so that you know. Essentially, you use the return on investment to to pay down the mortgage, re reloan the money, and and now the interest on that part becomes deductible. So it's just a cycle, and you just keep on basically doing this maneuver over and over. And over the years, again, your total facility stays the same, but but. Um, you're shifting and, and making more of the interest you pay, more of that deductible for tax purposes uh, versus not. Okay. Um, so moving on to the next the next strategy. So this so now what I'm going to talk about next is really about uh, how can we extract funds from a corporation in a more tax effective manner. Okay, and again, I thought I'd start with a an example, and this example is a true example. Like I've implemented this transaction over uh, for two clients over the past year, um, and uh, essentially, what they wanted to do again with with the with the housing market the way it is, and you know, cheap cheap dollars um, to, to, to loan from, 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 from the banks. You know, the interest rates are so far really low. I know there's talk about hiking them up a bit, but, um, you know, and with the, with the uh, values of real estate just going through the roof, you know, people have been purchasing more, more and more real estate for investment purposes. And so we had a situation where um, it was actually a, a dentist where they had their principal residence. Um, they wanted to purchase a new residence, but they wanted to keep their existing residence and start to rent it. So they, they would use their existing residence now as an investment property and purchase a new home. Um, so, so the principal residence that they, they owned was worth 1.5 and they had a mortgage of 400 on that. And they wanted to buy a new home, which was worth about 2 million. And the banks required them to put down a $500,000 deposit. The problem was the money was trapped in the corporation, in, in, the, in the professional corporation. So in order for the individual to pull half a million dollars out of the corporation, you know, that was gonna cost them a $250,000 tax bill, essentially. Again, assuming top marginal tax rates. So we came up with a strategy where we're like, okay, how can we, what can we do to get this $500,000 out of the professional corporation in a more tax efficient manner? And so what we did, and so, so again, Mr. A is, is the dentist. So Opco is the professional corporation, which has all the, the, the cash sitting there. So what we did is we created a real estate company, which is also owned by Mr. A, okay? And what we did is we said, well, if Mr. A sells his existing home to Realco, then Realco would have to pay Mr. A for that house. Okay, so Realco then would need the money to pay for the home. So what we said is, okay, well, the money is in, in Opco. So if Opco loans the money to Realco, so the 500,000 that we need to, to, to essentially purchase the new home. So Opco will loan the money to Realco 
between corporations, you can loan money. There's no tax implications, so it's not an issue. Realco would then purchase the, the principal residence, the existing principal residence from the dentist. So for fair value, so it's for $1.5 million, Realco would assume the mortgage that the, that property currently had on it. So essentially of 400,000, it would pay Mr. A the 500,000 cash that it loaned from Opco. And it will issue a further promissory note to Mr. A for the difference. And really as the, as the cash accumulates in Opco, Opco would be able to loan that money over to Rilco and pay down that promissory note also. Um, and then once Mr. A receives that $500,000 of cash um, that, that on, on, you know, as part consideration for the sale of the principal residence, it takes that money and essentially uses it as the deposit on the home. And essentially what we've done is we've extracted $500,000 tax-free from the company. And I'll, again, why tax-free? So again, if we did no planning, the tax bill would have been 250 on, on the 500,000. With the planning, remember, this individual sold a principal residence for fair value, but because it's principal residence, there's no tax. It's the individual claims principal residence exemption. So on the sale of the property from Mr. A to Rilco, the individual is paying zero tax. On that transfer, again, um, the consideration, again, was the assumption of the mortgage. So 1.5 less the $400,000 mortgage, which essentially gave access it gave Mr. A access to essentially $1.1 million of, call it tax-free money that, it, that he can extract from the company as the company is, is, is generates the money. So again, initially they needed the 500,000 to pay for the deposit on the new home. The money was available. We paid it out as part, again, repayment of the, of the, the proceeds on the sale of the property. And, but they can they have another six hundred thousand that they can draw down um, to you know against against the the proceeds of 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 that of that home um, in addition again in the future now the real co owns that property in the future as that property increases in value real co would also be able to refinance that home and extract more equity from that home, um, you know, and, and use that ex additional funds to, to reinvest uh, in future investments within the real estate company. Okay. Um, now, obviously, if, if at, you know, at, at the end of the day, if when the company, if they decide to sell that home, uh, the company will sell that home, the company will pay uh, tax on any uh, accrued values in excess of 1.5 million. Um, and then obviously, as you extract the money from future funds in excess of the 1.1 million, obviously then there's personal taxes to be paid. But, but this strategy worked really nicely, especially in this, in, in, in this case because of the principal residence uh, circumstances. Again, it, it's, it's a sweet deal to, you know, to sell the property for fair value and pay no, no, no personal taxes. Now we've used the same transaction um, in, in different ways. For example, um, let's just say an individual has a stock portfolio um, with, with a fair value of say half a million dollars and a cost base of say 300,000. Um, we've used the strategy where we can roll the investments to a corporation under on a tax deferred basis, so we don't trigger the capital gains. And, um, and then the individual will be able to extract up to the cost base of the asset. So he won't be able to extract the full 500, but they'll be able to extract the 300 cost base of the investments from the company tax-free. Essentially what you're doing is you're selling your personal assets to, to the corporation. 
uh, and and the corporation is paying you back uh, for 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 those uh, investments. But again, I, this 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 strategy, I think, again for especially because of the principal residence issue, it it, it was it, it really worked out nicely for 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 these clients. Um, So now next, the next strategy, strategy I wanted to talk about is um, the, 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 the uh, pipeline. So this strategy, this, this, has, this transaction has been around a long time. Canada Revenue Agency never really liked it. This strategy was used a lot and is acceptable in post-mortem planning as part of estate planning. Um, but again, it, it, it can also be used, you know, outside the, the, the concept of, of post-mortem planning. Um, the CRA never like it just because um, you, you'll see why essentially you're stripping out funds from the company at half the tax rate. And, but you know, they never really, did anything about it because it wasn't being used uh, that often. And and in order, you know, there's a cost in doing it, and it's only it's only uh, viable to do when when you're dealing with you know larger sums of money. Um, so it was always kind of left on the back burner. Um, we would implement it ourselves more as a band aid, as opposed to as initially to you know a strategy. Uh, like a proactive strategy to extract funds, we would use it, use it as a band-aid where we'd have clients, for example, we'll be doing their year end. And, you know, in addition to their salary, um, we noticed that they've drawn out of their company $900,000. Again, I've had this true situation. Um, and, and, you know, they hadn't consulted with us and we're doing their year and we're like, holy smokes, like you, you, what is this draw of 900,000? It's like, oh, you know, I bought myself a cottage. It's like, okay, well, you just created yourself essentially a half million dollar tax liability. And, and, and then they panic, obviously. And uh, so we're like, okay, how can we, what can we do to minimize that, that um, tax bill? And again, so we kind of use this pipeline transaction to 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 minimize that that um, that uh, tax liability. So again, it was kind of a reactive transaction to, to to fix, if you like, or minimize the taxes on things that clients would have done without kind of uh, um, consulting with us uh, earlier. Um, having said that, again, like I mentioned earlier, back in the budget of 2018. A lot of the income splitting opportunities we had and strategies we had for for again owner managed businesses, they were they were shut down by the government, and this pipeline transaction was initially shut down. So they had announced the changes in July of 2017. At that in that announcement, they actually said they're shutting down the pipeline. But then come December 2017, they retracted from saying that and said, we're not touching it. And, and so this kind of, this strategy is kind of one of the few remaining strategies that allows us to get some tax savings um, for, for, you know, from extracting corporate dollars. Um, so uh, having said that, again, we, we, we know they, they still don't like it. And we think they will eventually shut it down but you know for the for, for the past so you know three four years this this pipeline transaction has now become the thing of today so whereas before it was you know a, a transaction that that very few people knew about from, from a from a from an advisory point of view and it wasn't implemented that often now it's like, it's the buzzword. Like we have clients coming into our office, like what's this pipeline thing? So the word's out there, it's become very, very popular. And, um, 
and again, when things become popular and CRA don't like them, they eventually shut them down. So, but in the meantime, you know, while it's still available, we we uh, we uh, we continue to to implement the transaction. Now, they they can simply shut this this transaction down just by increasing the capital gains inclusion rate. So right now, this transaction works nicely because. Um, you know, if when you sell an when you sell something, the capital gains, fifty percent of the gain is tax free, and fifty percent of the gain is taxable. So if we assume the maximum tax rates, the maximum tax rate right now on a capital gain is is twenty six percent. So this transaction, and and I, I'll go through the mechanics of it, but this transaction essentially allows you, if assuming you're in the top bracket, it will allow you to strip out. Um, funds from the company at a 26% tax rate versus 53%, or, or if in the form of a dividend, you know, 48%. So, so again, there's a the tax savings average 20%. Again, assuming top marginal rate, um, and, and you know, you could also do it in such a way that you can you can create a future revenue stream. So you can you can even though if the cash flow isn't there in the company, but you have the retained earnings to do it, you can actually create this transaction, trigger this capital gain, and then draw down on the gain, you know, on, on the funds in the future. Um, so again, the pros of this pipeline transaction are, are again extracting funds in the form of capital gains versus income the tax savings guaranteed 20 percent could be possibly even up to 24 percent um again be able to create a future revenue stream what are the cons the cons are again like i mentioned that is considered to be an aggressive transaction cra don't like it um it is subject to audit and when I say audit, we've had this transaction audited uh, for a client, and it 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 went through no adjustments. Um, I think it's a complex transaction to implement, and I think what CRA would do if they audit the transactions, um, as opposed to auditing the the the, um, the 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 number, if you like, what they would audit are the steps. So, because if you miss one step, the whole transaction is is is, is basically tainted. Um, so, you know, it takes it takes let's say four steps to do the transaction, but you can actually arrive at the same result in three steps. But if you miss the one step, again, the whole transaction is is offside. So, I think if the transaction does get audited, um, um, I think they would they would audit more the the process and see if you followed all the right steps um, again in, in the audit we had it was part of a, an, a, a, an income tax audit so it was part of a bigger audit um, they didn't really go through the steps they just wanted to understand what the transaction was and we explained it to them and they had no no further questions on it um, but but again this transaction is being being uh, implemented um, by the big downtown law firms, you know, the big four accounting firms, and they're doing it for considerable amounts. I mean, initially when we started doing this transaction, we were kind of looking at a million dollar extraction from from the from the company, um, and then you know maybe two million. But we always said, you know, don't get greedy, stay out of the spotlight until we, you know, you go to some presentations of these big law firms downtown and. They're doing this transaction for like $24 million, like big, big bucks. So, so again, and 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 their point was if it works for a million, it works for 24 million. Like if the transaction works, it works. Um, um, so so again, it, it's just as long as you follow the, the steps, you should be okay. Um, the, the other the other downside of this transaction is again. So let's just say you implement the transaction in 2022 for a million dollars. 
So that million dollars is gonna is essentially gonna create a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar personal tax liability. So the tax liability is created at the personal level. That tax liability is due with your personal taxes. So by April thirtieth of the following year. So from a cash flow perspective, so if we do it for a million, and 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 you tell me, well, I don't have a million dollars, like I only have five hundred thousand dollars right now we can still implement the transaction for a million. <clears throat> we need 250 to pay the taxes by April of the following year. So the taxes have to get paid. And then you're left with, you know, you can, you're left with 250 in cash. You can pay that out to yourself. So now the company would owe you another 500 because we did it for a million. You stripped out 250 to pay the tax. You stripped out 250 for yourself. You're left with 500,000. Okay, that 500,000, you can draw down on that. Essentially, it becomes a, a shareholder loan. So you can draw down that over the years as the money starts to generate in the company. You can draw that down, and that's kind of what I what I meant by earlier saying create a future revenue stream. So so as long as you have the cash flow. To, to settle the tax liability, whatever it is, you can draw down on that, on the remaining amount as the cash accrues in the company over an indefinite period of time, really, okay? So, so that's kind of the, the, uh, the benefit of that. So just to go through the mechanics of it. Okay, um, before we go there, so CRA do have, um, as, like I said, they do say this is aggressive, they don't like it, but what they did say, they came out with three uh, criteria, and they said as long as these three, three criteria are met, and obviously the steps to implement are, are followed correctly and implemented correctly, um, you know, they, they would probably be okay with the transaction. So the three criteria that they're big on are, one, the operating company, so the company that you're extracting the funds from, it, after the transaction, it must continue to operate. So you can't wind up the company because when you wind up the company, that's a dissolution. When you extract funds from the company as part of a dissolution of the company, that is a dividend, like that's by, by legislation. So it doesn't work. So the company has to continue to operate and, and just just no different than, you know, pre post uh, the transaction, it's business as usual. They would prefer, again, that the funds are extracted in a progressive manner. So again, if we did this for a million dollars, they would rather you extract the million dollars over a period of time, as opposed to pulling all the funds at once. Um, now, on that point, again, like I mentioned earlier, we used to implement this transaction as a, as a band-aid, meaning the client's already taken the funds. So there's no, you know, that kind of, there's no progressive extraction of funds in those scenarios. We try as much as possible to meet this, this uh, criteria um, on new transactions that we're doing, but it's not always the case. Again, talking with some big uh, tax lawyers downtown Toronto, they don't think this is you know, they don't think CRA have any weight on this if it went to court. They said there's nothing in the in the act that says you have to extract progressive progressively. Uh, they they truly believe if the funds are there, take them out. But anyways, we're kind of where we can. We try and be a bit more more cautious. And then the third criteria is is maintain you know the the, the structure for at least three years. So again, to implement this transaction, there is, it's kind of a, there's a reorganization. So we have to sometimes create a new holding company um, and, and CRA want to see the structure that you create. They want you to hold that structure for at least three years. So, you know, they don't want you to implement the transaction and just wind it up. Um, again, talking with the with the, the lawyers downtown, they they, Again, they're like, what's the difference? They said they don't see any weight to that to that um, uh, um, you know um, argument. So, but again, I mean, there's no harm in keeping it open. Really, it's it's just essentially you end up with a shell company, um, and 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 then you can wind it up or amalgamate it um, three years later. So so 
the most important one is the company that it's the first one the company has to continue to operate okay that that's key and and again even the lawyers downtown they 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 said they said that that's the most important and that's key to the whole to the whole uh, transaction um, so so going through an example so again we have mr a who has the opco okay so so the cash and the value is an opco so we create a holding company okay and then mr a would take part of the common shares and exchange them for special shares so if we want to do this transaction for say a million dollars then we would take a million dollars worth of common shares of opco and convert those shares into special shares which are worth a million dollars on the exchange again I'm, um, we basically trigger the capital gains so at that point the cost base in the shares is nominal so when we do the share for share exchange we're triggering the capital gain there so mr a at that point now trigger the capital gain and has to pay the tax on the capital gain um, again with their personal taxes so now Mr. A would own the common shares in Opco and also owns special shares in Opco worth a million dollars, but the cost base, because we triggered the capital gain, the cost base of the million share of the, the special shares is also a million dollars. So you have special shares with a fair value and cost base of a million dollars. So then Mr. A <coughs> sells the special shares to hold co in exchange for a promissory note. So, so essentially, up, Mr. A will sell those special shares to hold co. Okay, so now hold co would have the special shares in opco, and hold co owes money to Mr. A. Hold co owes a million dollars to Mr. A. On the cat on on the sale of the special shares, there's no tax because again. The fair value and the cost base of the shares are both a million dollars, so there's no gain on that. Um, but Holdco has to pay Mr. A for the special shares, so basically we issue a promissory note. So now Holdco owes Mr. A, and Holdco also has shares in Opco worth a million dollars. Now, in order the cash, remember the cash is sitting in Opco. Now, because we, in order to meet the requirement of keeping the, 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 the structure in place for three years, what we do next is Opco will loan money. So let's just say the full million dollars is available, okay? You know, keeping aside the, the condition of extracting the funds progressively, let's just say Opco has all the money. So Opco now can loan the money to Holdco, the million dollars, and Holdco pays the million dollars to Mr. A, okay? So the, the flow of funds would go from Opco to Holdco out to Mr. A. So now Mr. A has a million dollars in his hand. Again, April 30th of the subsequent year, he's gonna take 250 of that. He's gonna pay his personal taxes, but he's left with $750,000. So essentially we've extracted Again, a million dollars at 26% tax as opposed to 53% tax, or, or again, if it was in the form of a dividend, 48% tax. So definitely, you know, a 20, average 20% tax savings, tax savings there. Um, in the, in, in the, right, so then the cash would be paid, the promissory note. So, so then just looking at the structure again, three years, so, so at this point, again, Holdco owns the special shares in Opco worth a million. Opco has a loan due from Holdco of a million. So three years in, when we want to collapse the structure, we can, there's two ways to do it. We can either just amalgamate Opco and Holdco and they just become one company. So the special shares are canceled. And obviously on, on, on amalgamation, the intercompany loan is, 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 is gone. Alternatively, if we if some clients say no, I want to keep the hold co, uh, you know, maybe for future use. At that case, what we would do is redeem the special shares. 
So when we redeem the special shares, now Opco owes Holdco a million dollars, but Holdco owes Opco. So essentially they each owe a million dollars to each other. So essentially we just offset those intercorporate loans and, and they just become two standalone companies. Okay. So um, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of, again, it's a pretty complex transaction. Again, that's very high level. Like I mentioned, there is, there is, uh, there are steps you have to follow and those steps are, are very important. Um, so again, just to put some numbers to it. So let's just say, again, a, a, um, an individual wants to extract 500,000 under a, a regular scenario, so no pipeline. Um, if we extract that 500,000 in the form of a non-eligible dividend, you'd be paying 48% tax. The tax would be 238,000. If we do it in the, in the form of the pipeline, that 500,000 is gonna come out in the form of capital gains at 26.76%. So your tax savings right there is $105,000. Um, and that's pure savings. Um, um, yeah. Okay, so moving on to the, the, the last uh, strategy we have, which is what we call the prescribed rate loan. So again, let's, so it's, it's, it's uh, an, an opportunity for in family income splitting with, with lower income family earners. Uh, you can use this strategy to even income split with minors using a, a family trust. Um, again, there is an interest rate associated with the loan. So again, that's why it's called the prescribed rate loan. The prescribed rate is essentially the interest rate that is prescribed by the government. Right now, the prescribed rate interest rate is 1%. Um, now, if you implement the transaction with a 1% interest rate, even in the future, if the government increases the prescribed rate, interest rate, um, that your, your loan is locked in at the 1%. So it does not, the interest rate is, is fixed based on at the time when the loan is created. The only thing is the, the interest has to be paid and, and physically paid, the funds have to be moved by January 30th of the following year. So if, if, if you implement, a, you know, if, so for say 2021, um, people who had this prescribed rate loan in place, um, they, they had to pay that 1% interest no later than, you know, January 30th of this year. So how does this, how does this work? Essentially, let's say we have, again, Let's say family, family of four, husband, wife, two, two minor kids. Uh, the spouse, the wife is a stay-at-home mom. The dad, you know, is say is earning, he's, you know, earning good money. High, let's say he's in earning a salary over 220, so he's in the higher tax bracket. And he also has a, an investment portfolio, a non-registered investment portfolio. Okay. Uh, so any investment income he's earning, he's paying the top tax rate on that. So if we, we say, okay, well, how can we shift that investment income and tax it in the, in, in the lower income family members, i.e. the spouse and the kids? So if we, again, typically we would create a trust, a family trust. The, the husband, the dad would, would now take the investment so, so in the form of, let's just say cash in the investments, yes, there'll be a tax bill, pay the tax bill. Now you have X amount of dollars, say again, half a million dollars of cash. The dad would loan the money to the trust. Again, that loan is subject to 1%. The trust will invest the money. So the, the investment income that is earned by the trust now, is no longer the income of, 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 of the dad, it's income to the trust. The trust will pay the 1% interest to the, to, the, to the dad, so that's gonna be income to the dad. 
but the remaining income, the net income is, is trust income. So then at that point, what we would do is we never tax the income in the trust because a, a, a trust is taxed at the top tax rates. So we would then allocate the income to the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries of the trust would be the spouse and the kids, even if they're minors. Um, so then essentially you, you play it out to, to the kids and, and the spouse. And again, assuming the kids and spouse have no other income, Essentially, you can pay up to approximately fifteen thousand dollars each, with no tax uh, liability, because because of the again the first fifteen thousand I'm, I'm rounding numbers, but the first fifteen thousand of income is tax free because you get your personal deduction. Okay, so so the tax savings could be could be huge, and this this works nicely. So I implemented this for a client. Um, who essentially had two young kids, um, basically a four-year-old and a six-year-old. And we didn't, we didn't get the spouse involved because the spouse was earning their own, her own income, so it wasn't worth it. But we created the trust for the minor kids. We created this, this prescribed rate loan. And essentially, the the... The kids, you know, I mean, because of their age, they're so young, they they have at least a 10-year period, if not more than that, of, of these tax savings. Because these kids, you know, four and six, they've got at least 10 years. So they're 16 years old, maybe until they start to earn some income. So, you know, over the long term, that, that the tax savings could be could be really, really, really good. Um So again, just to put in numbers to this. So if we have um, Mr. A, this is, so the first column is if we do nothing. So Mr. A has investments of 500,000, assume a 5% return, 25,000. At the maximum rate, he's gonna pay 12,500 in taxes. If we introduce the prescribed rate loan and shift the investment income to the spouse. So now the investments are under the spouse. Again, the spouse, I have Mrs. A there, that could be a trust. Uh, this, this transaction can be either implemented via trust or just through what we call a spousal prescribed rate loan trust. And that would be just with the spouse. Um, so the investments would go with the spouse, 500,000. Again, earn 25,000 on that. Now again, we have to pay the one percent back to the to the, the the person loaning the money, right? So Mr. A, so Mr. A is gonna earn in interest income of five thousand, but Mrs. A will get a deduction for that. So now we have taxable income still twenty five thousand, but it's split five to Mr. A, twenty to Mrs. A. So on the five thousand, Mr. A will pay fifty percent, twenty five hundred bucks. But Mrs. A, because she has no other income, on 20,000, she will only pay 7.5%. So that's 1,500 bucks. So by doing this, again, the overall savings is 8,500 bucks. Now, if you can multiply this by more persons, right? Again, it all comes down to the numbers, but if you can multiply this by more persons and again, do it through a trust and with minors, you probably can get a lot more out of it again um so it, it i think it's 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 really again if you have non-registered funds um where you could you could possibly do some good planning on that um and 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 then the last point i want to make is you know how do we consolidate all this what we've learned today so what we've done for one client, so one client had a lot of money sitting in a corporation, okay? And the corporation's earning the investment income. The individual who owns the company has a high salary playing top, top bracket. So we're like, what can we do to do some income splitting? So what we ended up doing is we implemented the pipeline to extract the money from the company. Yes, we paid the, the, the capital gains, 
the individual had to pay the capital gains, but it's 26%, which is a very reasonable tax rate. We took, if it, again, using a million dollars, we took the 750, because the 250 had to go to taxes. We took the 750, moved that to a trust, a prescribed rate loan trust, and did the, the prescribed rate loan planning. So essentially we used two of these transactions. We used the pipeline to extract the money and we used the prescribed rate loan to take that money and income split with it. And, um, and, and again, the, the tax savings, again, there are young kids involved and, and the tax savings in, in, in the long term would be, would, you know, are gonna be significant. And you know, yes, the, the client had to pay that initial two hundred and fifty thousand dollars taxes up front. But again, at a twenty six percent tax rate, it's not. It's not. I don't think it's a big deal. And and the tax savings you're going to get by income splitting over the years will outweigh that quite a bit. Um, yeah. So and just to wrap up, I mean, prescribed rate loan trust. We actually implemented this for. One other client, we actually ended up income splitting with a literally a two-month-old baby. We had we filed a tax return for a two-month-old baby. So um, again, through the prescribed rate loan trust that we created. So so it's a good it's a good transaction and and it works again provided the the funds uh, are are available. And that concludes the um, the the. The presentation. Um, I see we have a few questions, so I'll address the questions. So the first, the first question I have is, can a person use mortgage instead of a HELOC, so a home equity line of credit, for the interest deductibility? So the answer to that is yes. Um, what's important is the use of the funds. Okay. So um, in order for the interest to be deductible, the mortgage or the, the line of credit has to be used to purchase, if you like, income producing assets. So you can't use you know, the interest on the mortgage of your home because your home is not producing income. It's, not a, it's, a, it's a personal asset, personal use asset. So, it, Again, in whatever form the loan is taken out as, as long as it's a loan taken out for purposes of earning income, the interest will be deductible. Um, the next question is, when you transfer the investment portfolio in the past example, I said it was tax-free, is there an election to be filed under Section 85? Yes. So basically, if you're going to be transferring a, if you answer a, sorry, if you transfer a stock portfolio to a corporation to extract the cost base from the company, I mentioned you can do that on a tax deferred basis. That is a Section 85 rollover. And yes, there are legal documents that have to be drafted. And there is a Section 85 election form that has to be filed with the government. Um, the sale of principal residence to Realco is an excellent idea. I believe it would be subject to land transfer tax, or is there any way to do that on a land transfer tax deferred basis? Correct. So yes, on the transfer, uh, so in the example we did where the individual sold his principal residence to the Realco, yes, correct, land transfer tax will apply. Um, but then again, we wanted to extract half a million dollars. What would you rather pay? $250,000 in taxes to the government or would you rather pay $25,000 or $20,000 in land transfer taxes? So again, there is a cost to it, but we're, we're just trying to minimize the cost. okay? Uh, is there a TOSI issue if you do a pipeline and then a prescribed rate loan? Um, so TOSI only applies to dividends um, and possibly some capital gains distributions from corporations. So um, once you extract, like the, the, the pipeline does not involve dividends. The pipeline, again, is essentially you're creating, 
essentially you're selling shares of your company to yourself. So there's a capital gain there. Um, and, and the funds are being extracted in the form of proceeds of sale of a, of a, of a company. Once the, once the, once the uh, funds are in personal hands, uh, TOSI no longer applies. What can apply is the income attribution rules, but again, to a prescribed, if you, if you, if you just give the money to your spouse or to your kids, um, you, you just gift it, yes, the income will be attributed back to, to you. But if you do it through the prescribed rate loan trust, so you're not gifting the funds, you're loaning the funds. And there is, the key point is the interest. There has to be that prescribed interest rate there uh, associated with the loan. And like I mentioned earlier, the interest has to be paid like the funds have to move. You can't pay it by way of promissory note. You have to move the money no later than January 30th. If you follow those steps, then the income attribution would not, would not apply. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so um, next question. Thank you for the info, Richard. I have a hold co holding many rental properties, which I wish to start to liquidate and there will be significant funds remaining once the shareholder loan is paid. I also have another company that holds investment vehicle that has a million shareholder loan to pay. Can I, can hold co one lend hold co to the funds to pay out the shareholder loan or is there a better strategy? Okay, so essentially this question involves two corporations uh, they're both investment corporations. One of them is holding um, uh, some some rental properties. They want to liquidate the the rental properties, uh, and then you know so there's now let's say cash sitting in this company, but there's a, a shareholder loan in the other company. So the question is, can company A loan the money to company B to pay down the shareholder loan? The answer to that is yes, you can. Um, obviously, there will always be outstanding the the um, intercompany loan, um, and that loan would eventually have to be paid once you know Company B sells its assets. Alternatively, over time, you can even amalgamate those two companies, and and, and you know the intercompany loan would just disappear. Um, is there the second question to that is, is is there a better strategy um again with with passive investment companies it's a bit like we you can't implement the pipeline unless there is an operating company uh active business within within the structure if it's all passive that that's a bit harder to do um but um again we, we, we can look at alternatives, you know, at the top of my head, it's hard to say, but uh, we could see if there's any other strategies because we'd, we'd have to look at the big picture, see, you know, who's involved, like family members, is there something we can do with them, things, things like that. Um, can the trust hold mortgages for grown kids? Um, that's, a, <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't think so. Um, so here's the thing with trust owning real estate. Um, I'm assuming mortgages for real estate, uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but uh, back in the day, typically we were able to hold, um, if, it, if you're taking a mortgage to buy a piece of real estate in the trust, we were able to hold title in the, in the name of the trust today it's, that's not allowed anymore. It actually has to be held in the in the name of in the name of uh, the, the 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 trustee. So so the, the 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 title will actually be held in the name of the trustee in trust for. Um, so the mortgage would then have to be held the similar way. Um, okay, the individual just added a part. Yes, it is for personal homes for grown kids. Okay. So if it's for personal homes, you don't want to hold them in a trust. You, you want to have the individual's own title. The reason I say that is if you, if it's, if this, if these homes are eventually, you know, are supposedly going to be 
their principal residences. Um, if you own, and again, this was a change that was done a few years ago. If you hold a principal residence in a trust, you lose access to your principal residence exemption. This is a change that happened, I would say, five years ago, maybe five, six years ago. Back in the day, we were allowed to hold principal residences in trust. That, that they, they stopped that. There are only a few exceptions in the case of disabled persons and some other, some other cases. But today, you do not want to hold principal residences in trusts because you lose your exemption uh, on the sale. Um, so you'd be, you'd be better off, um, again, having your kids, if it's for the kids, own the properties um, directly or have it joint with them, right? Um, so, so they can't go off and, and sell it without your, your signature. Um, and um, that's all I got questions. Um, so unless there's anything else, we, let me just see here, there could, yeah, I think that's, uh, That's all I got questions. So with that, oh, there's one more. Okay, one more question. So if you and your spouse are retired, I'm just, I'm just waiting for the question to come in. Okay, so if you and your spouse are retired and both are living off the hold co, how can one better strategize income when only one has shareholder loans? Um, again, what we can do is look at, again, there are strategies we could implement if, if there's only, you know, so again, looking at Tozi rules, age comes into that. Um, if, if, if one of the spouses is the sole shareholder and, and you know, to, obviously there's, we've got to be careful with these Tozi rules with income splitting, but you know, sometimes there's strategies depending on age, for example, one of them is if the shareholder sp spouse is age 65 or older, you can actually bring in the spouse as a shareholder and pay dividends to them too. So you can income split that way. But again, the, the, there is that age requirement of 65, not to the recipient uh, spouse, it's the spouse that, that, let's call it the shareholder spouse. Um, so that's one strategy. Again, it's hard to, it's hard to kind of, th there's things we could do, but I'd have to kind of look at the, the, the big picture and, and, you know, analyze the circumstances in more detail to see what sort of strategies we can. So, so again, I mean, if, if there's specific things you, you would like us to look at, feel free to contact myself directly or, or you know, your, your partner here at Bateman McKay, and um, we can look at that for you on a, on a, on a personal basis. Okay. So on that note, I would just like to thank everybody for joining us and uh, have a great day. It seems to be a bit of a warmer day today. I don't know if it's the calm before the storm because they said we're expecting another snowstorm on Thursday. But uh, anyways, enjoy your days and uh, hope to see you on the next presentation soon. Thank you very much.